But you can find him, his, his name is very distinctive, so it's really easy to find his name is Jay Ku, K-H-O-O. He's not Chinese, but I think he's, he, I think he lives in New Zealand. But he's been following China for a long time. He wrote this very interesting document as a response to, and I think he's out of that group now, because they had written a thing called China's Long March to Capitalism. And certainly there's a lot of capitalism in China. But his argument with them is that they, they don't understand what's really happening in China. Uh, we don't support China as, I mean, China doesn't have an internationalist foreign policy. It really doesn't. But we don't also believe that, I mean, the Chinese government can do things that the United States government can't do. Like, they, they can say, okay, we're, we're having this new policy and, and all the companies have to follow the policy. In the United States, the companies say what they want the government to do. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no kind of, so we don't consider any of them fully, fully socialist. Vietnam has a largely market economy as a Communist Party in power, it's not a, full, a completely capitalist country either. North Korea has a million problems, it has a socialized economy, uh, and, and Cuba does too. But beyond them, and whether or not they were socialist or not, our understanding of the world is, is a, see you later, uh, is, is based on you know, looking first and foremost at what is the United States trying to do? What is U.S. imperialism trying to do? It's really important to look at, to, to understand what the U.S. global strategy is and why they target certain countries. I mean, I think any time any of us who are conscious, socialist, progressive people hear the government of the United States start talking about human rights violations anywhere in the world, a little light should go on. You know, bing! Why are they talking about that? Did they wake up this morning feeling like, you know, about you know some poor people somewhere while well, yesterday they were bombing the hell out of them and destroying their country, but today they're concerned about human rights? I mean, it's never true. It's never the reason when they put that forward. I mean, I was talking earlier today about Iran. You know, they, you know are really, they're really concerned about election violations in Iran or the rights of women in Iran. Or let's take a little trip across the Persian Arabian Gulf to Saudi Arabia, you know, where you don't have to worry about election violations because there are, there are no elections and where women have no rights at all, but because the ruling class of that country that's a junior partner of imperialism does what the oil companies and the banks want, you don't read much about that in the media, but every day you hear about Iran. So, uh, so you know, sometimes people would say, like about Iraq, when the, when the two Iraq wars were happening, especially the second one, they said, we were supporters of Saddam Hussein. Uh, well, we weren't really supporters of Saddam Hussein, we understand the Ba'ath Party, we understood its character, we understood that it was an anti-communist party that also called itself socialist. But we defend Iraq's right to exist as an independent country. The U.S. didn't have any problem with Saddam Hussein. They weren't upset about Saddam Hussein when Saddam Hussein was allied with the United States. But like a lot of other leaders, whether it was Noriega in Panama or Saddam Hussein or uh, Ahmadinejad in Iran today, it's when those leaders won't do, won't kneel before Washington. Even if they've had relationships before, like, uh, like Saddam Hussein did in Noriega and Panama, they had long relationships with imperialism, but then when they wouldn't completely capitulate, then they become targeted and so forth. So we defend them as oppressed countries, and that goes for most of the countries that have adopted a, a socialist system, or so, you know, that have socialized economies. Uh, they come from the, they, their struggle to be able to develop socialism or some variant of socialism is also completely connected with their struggle to have self-determination as countries. They're all countries that were colonized or, 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 or neo they were neo-colonies before. And we defend their right to independence unconditionally. Unconditionally, and that is hard for people to understand. When the first Gulf War happened, and some of the same people who organized the Answer Coalition uh, were the key people in organizing what was then called the National Emergency Committee. Uh, na well, no, the National uh, Coalition Against U.S. Intervention in the Middle East. There was a big split in the anti-war movement. Then there was another big split in, in 2003 in the anti-war movement. And there probably always will be as long as imperialism exists because there's the loyal opposition and the disloyal opposition. And the, I, that's how I what, what would term them. They, the, loyal, the people I'm calling loyal opposition might object to that. But I think that what they were saying in the first Gulf War was, okay, Iraq invaded Kuwait, 
And we have to condemn Correct for doing that. We have to condemn Saddam Hussein, and we have to support sanctions, not war. And we said, well, we're not going to do, we don't agree with any of those things. Uh, you know, it's not up to, Kuwait is not the part of the United States. Uh, you know, and there was a long historical debate between, I mean, Kuwait was part of Iraq, and it was cut out of Iraq in 1922 when the British took over the region. Everybody in Iraq, if you, I've been to Iraq a couple times, everybody you talk to, whether they're Kurdish or Shia or Sunni Arab, they all agree Kuwait's part of Iraq. Uh, that wasn't a, a minority view or, some, or just Saddam Hussein's opinion. So we're not, why would we send half a million troops halfway around the world because Iraq uh, took over Kuwait? Is that really a dispute for the United States? And also, by the way, sanctions are really a form of economic warfare. And we did a lot on this issue in the 1990s and early 2000s, but about the genocidal impact on Iraq of the sanctions. And, the, and, and so the people on the other side who were arguing with us in the anti-war movement about this and who were saying, you have to condemn Saddam Hussein and you have to say sanctions, not war, because otherwise the in Congress, the people who are against the war won't even talk to us because they have to say that in order to have any legitimacy in the inside of what's the acceptable society, you know, acceptable uh, 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 polity of the United States. So we said, yeah, well, <laughs> they're not going to stop the war either. Uh, and and uh, but this idea of how you orient people is the idea of saying sanctions, not war, or we have to condemn Iraq is like grows out of the sentiment that so many people are inculcated with in the United States that if something happens somewhere in the world that we have to do something, right? I mean, I hear people, I mean, all the time I had the debates with people, they say, finally, well, if the sanctions weren't good and you're against the war, didn't we have to do something? Well, then you have to break down that question. First of all, what do you mean by we, you know? And because we is a, is a, that's a, that's a really important starting point for people. Are we the United States of America? Or are we, you know, the, the working class of the United States of America? And is there a ruling class that is also uh, not only the enemy of the people around the world, but they're the, our enemy too? So what do you mean by we? And because really we, in that context, always ends up meaning you have to support something that the imperialist government is undertaking somewhere in the world. So I think, you know, that, and that's a good starting point with people, actually. That's a good arguing point, like, what do you mean by we? Uh, and, you know, and then, and then, you know, the next question is, why do we, no matter how you define the we, have to do something? Do you, do you support the idea of the policemen of the world? I mean, you know. Uh, but I think that all of those things serve to also show this demarcation line in the movement. And so back then it was called the the National Coalition for Peace and Justice or something like that. And this time it was called United for Peace and Justice. Uh, the, the coalitions that organized on the, on the basis that, you know, our main thing is how we can strengthen our representatives, the people who are on our side in Congress. Very few of them are on our side in Congress. Very, very, very few. Is it time to end this meeting? Uh, we can probably take maybe one or two more questions if anybody has something you would like to discuss. Yeah. I was just curious since you did indicated the beginning that you're Marxist, you know, Marxist and Leninist, but, you know, wouldn't uh, be sympathetic to Stalin. What are some of your criticisms of Stalin that would prevent you guys from being sympathetic, like, say, other parties in the U.S. at the time? Right? Well, <clears throat> as I said, we supported, we considered, like, in, if you look back in history, we considered that at every stage, the Soviet Union no matter what the policy of the leaders was at a particular time, was something to be defended against imperialism. So even when you know there were things that's, that the Stalin government was doing or other governments that we very much disagreed with, we still supported the existence of that state against imperialism and against counter-revolution, which eventually came from within. But we thought that the we thought that the Stalin leadership. Uh, uh, did a lot of damage actually to the international communist movement. Uh, it, it, uh, it, in the late 1930s, when, it, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a long story, but in the, in the late 20s, the Stalin, when once Stalin had established himself in power as the, as the central leader, uh, there was a sh they, they took a sharp turn to the left. 
and actually adopted a lot of what Trotsky's program had been for collectivization of industry and agriculture, but did it in a very rough way, very, very rough way. And this was in 1928. And along with that, uh, took a, a big turn to the left internationally. And all the communist parties, which were quite vigorous, a lot of them were quite vigorous at the time, I started saying that the socialist parties and everybody who wasn't them, basically, who was on the left, were social fascists. And one of the things that that led to was that the socialists and the communists had a majority of the votes, and they commanded the allegiance of the working class in Germany. But because the communists took this very sectarian position, even to the point uh, where Stalin and the, the leadership of the German Communist Party in, the, in 1932 said, well, if the Nazis come to power, that'll be okay. The, the socialists are really social fascists anyways. 